welcome. Welcome to God's house this morning. Welcome those of you who are watching online as we continue our study. We began a series a couple of weeks ago and that, um, that coincides with the, with the theme that God gave us for this year. Our theme is uh, what? Arise. Arise. And our theme is based on a couple of verses that we find in the Old Testament. In the First Testament, uh, uh, the prophet Isaiah wrote this in Isaiah 60, verses 1 and 2. Come on, let's read it together. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears over you. What a wonderful promise that God has given us, but that promise comes with a call to action, and the call to action is to do what? Arise and shine. And we've talked about the fact that as the people of God, we reflect the light and the glory of Jesus. Is there, is there still darkness in the world? Absolutely. There are still the overarching, the overarching mindset of the world is a rejection of God and his truth. It goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden when man chose to determine what was good and evil. And today man still chooses to determine what is good and evil rather than looking at what God says is good and evil. The good news is that in the midst of all this darkness, there's a light shining. And it shines through whom? Come on, turn to somebody say through you. If you're the part of the church, the, the light shines through you. God has chosen to reflect his light through us. And if we are choosing not to shine, then Jesus is limited in what he can do. So the call is very simple. Arise and shine because the light and the glory of Jesus is, has risen on you. He, he shines through you. And so our theme this year is very simple. We want, we're going to be a church. We're going to be a people that takes heed to the call of, to action that God has given us. We're not going to stay seated. We're not going to stay laying down. We're going to arise and do what God has called us to do. We're going to arise and stop playing church start coming to church, stop coming to church, and start being the church, right? We don't just do church. We, we, don't, just, we don't just play church. We are being the church wherever we are. And so we're going to be that way in 2022 and until the king returns. Now, he may return before the end of 2022. Can I hear a praise the Lord? But if he doesn't, we're going to continue to be the church he's called us to be. So the first week we looked at the fact that as the people of God, we need to arise and go, right? There has to be a change of position. There has to be a coming onto the scene. There has to be an advancement. We need to move forward in the mission that God has given us. Otherwise, we are ceasing to be the church God's called us to be. Last week we saw that we were created to worship, to bring him honor and glory. And so we need to arise and what? And praise. We need to arise and praise. Praise is the action that reveals the worship in our hearts. Next week, we're going to look at the fact that we need to arise and live. Turn to, turn to someone and ask him this. Are, are, are you existing or are you living? Because there's a difference between existence and living. And God has called us to go beyond just mere existence. God has called us to live. To live the Christ life, the abundant life of the kingdom of God. Today, we're going to look at a very important subject, and that is the fact that we need to arise and serve. Arise and serve. If there was one facet of the kingdom life that Jesus emphasized and exemplified more than any other, it was this aspect of serving. Serving. In fact, look at what Jesus said his primary purpose for coming was. He says this in Mark 10, 45. He said, the son of man did not come to be served, but to what? To serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The son of man did not come to be served, even though he deserved to be served more than anybody else has ever deserved to be served. But he said, I have not come to be served. I have come to serve and to give. To serve and to give. Come on, say it with me. To serve and to give. He didn't beat around the bush. He didn't give you any religious mumbo jumbo. He said this. He said, I have come to serve and to give. So Jesus came to do what? 
Wow. Really, is that what he came for? Well, that's what he said he came for. And if Jesus, if Jesus came to serve and to give, if Jesus declared that his purpose to coming, for coming to this earth was to serve and to give, then what should his followers' purpose be? Yeah. How many want to be like Jesus? Well, that's the bottom line on this. So, so when we look at our first message of arising to go, arise and go, we have, a, we have Christ's mission to fulfill, amen? See, we, we have been tasked with finishing the mission that he paid for and started. He said, I'm going to the Father, but I'm leaving you on this earth to fulfill the mission, to finish the mission that I began, right? So we've been tasked with finishing what he started, yet... Yet, if we, we will never arise and go if we're not willing to serve and give. We will never arise and go if we're not willing to arise and serve. Last week, we looked at the fact that we need to arise and praise, yet we can't truly arise and praise until we are willing to serve and give. Serving is an integral part of worship. Many times the word worship is translated from the word that means serve. You cannot separate worship from serving and giving. They're combined, they're together, they're integral. And our shared purpose as Christ's church is to fulfill his mission. And we do it by committing ourselves to what? To arise and serve. Come on, say it with me. Arise and serve. You know, that's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. It's what it means to be his church. See, the Bible is very clear that Jesus is the head of the church. And it's also very clear that the church is his body. The head decides what needs to be done. The body gets it done. See, this morning, your head says, get up. Get out of bed. Your head said, go brush your teeth, hopefully. (laughs) Your head, thank the Lord, said, get dressed. But your body had to do what your head told you to do. And the head has told us to arise and serve. It's time for the body to do what the head has told us to do. It's time for the body to get it done. But there's also an even deeper element to serving like Jesus. See, God's ultimate purpose for you as an individual son and daughter of God is to make you like his one and only son, Jesus. That's his purpose for you. Listen to how the Apostle Paul lays it out in Romans. Romans 8. We, we love this one here. Look, we love verse 28. And we know that in all things, right? How many things? All. What does that God do? God works for the good of those who, number one, love him. And number two, who have been called according to his, come on somebody, purpose. Or really, what's his purpose? Well, verse 29 tells us. For those God foreknew, he also predestined. That's your destiny. That's been predetermined for every child of God. What's the predestination? What is the predetermined outcome? To be conformed to the image of his son that we might be firstborn among many brothers and sisters. You know why God works all things together for your good? Because he's making you more like Jesus. That's his purpose in your life. So God's goal is to make us more like Jesus. Let's personalize that instead of us. Let's say me, right? God's goal is to make me more like Jesus. Can you say that again? God's goal is to make me more like Jesus. That's his overarching goal in your life. The reason we arise and go, the reason we arise and praise, the reason we arise and serve is because we want to become more and more like Jesus. And as we walk with him, 
And as we allow his word to do its work in us and the Holy Spirit to do his work in us, guess what he's doing? He is making you more like Jesus. He brings you by faith into his family. And then he says, I want to make you like my son. So what he does is he begins to shape in us the character qualities of Jesus. That's the fruit of the spirit, right? In Galatians chapter five. And so he makes us in character more like Jesus. But as he makes us in character more like Jesus, he also begins to give us the qualities that Jesus exemplified. The qualities of life, the actions of Christ, those things begin to show up in our lives. That is what God wants to see. And so he begins to show us and begins to build in us the very same serving and giving qualities that were found in his son, Jesus. If you're following what I'm saying, just kind of nod your head a little bit. Okay, good. Very good. It's our primary purpose on earth. And here's what I want you to know today. To be like Jesus is to be a servant. You cannot be like Jesus if you're not a servant. And if you are a servant, you're like Jesus. You can't, you can't separate the two. And just so that we would never forget that principle, so that we would never forget that truth, Jesus preached one last sermon on the night of his betrayal. Hours before he would be arrested and eventually crucified for our sins, he spoke and he reminded his disciples. Listen, he could have reminded him of a myriad of principles that he had taught them in three plus years of ministry, three plus years of discipling them, of showing them what it means to be part of the kingdom of God. He could have chosen any, any principle, but he focused on the one principle that they could not afford to miss. And he preached this sermon that's found in John chapter 13. And I want you to stand with me if you would. Some of y'all need to get some blood flowing. John chapter 13. He preaches one more sermon without words. It was now the day before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father, a.k.a. the hour would come that he would lay down his life as a sacrifice for our sins, to die in our place, to take the hell that you and I deserve, be resurrected, and eventually be ascended to the right hand of the Father. Jesus and his disciples were at supper. The devil had already put into the heart of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, the thought of betraying Jesus. Every deed starts with a thought, doesn't it? And Jesus knew that the Father had given him complete power. He knew that he had come from God and was going to God. Stop there for one second. Let me just say this, that Jesus was very secure in who he was. There, if there's one thing that will nullify God's purpose in your life is insecurity. Insecurity will keep you from serving. Insecurity will keep you from doing everything that we're going to talk about today. Jesus was secure in who he was. He knew his identity. Y'all need to know your identity in Christ as well. Verse four, so he arose from the table, took off his outer garment and tied a towel around his waist. Then he poured some water into a wash basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and dry them with the towel around his waist. Father, thank you so much for your amazing love, for the grace that you have bestowed upon us. We stand here today in every air, every moment, every breath that we take, God, we take it in by your loving kindness and grace. Life is a gift from you. I pray, God, that we would use this gift of yours to honor you in everything we say and do. May we hear what your spirit wants us to hear. May we live what your spirit wants us to live. And we ask you these things for your glory and for our good in Jesus' name. And if you love the Lord, say amen. amen. You may be seated. So Jesus gathers with his disciples for one last supper. Obviously, we know we know this is the Passover supper, right? He has one final meal together and before he would die on the cross, die on their behalf. 
Now, before we get on, and I know many of you know this, but I just want to refresh your memory, or maybe some of you don't realize this, but it's important to understand the custom of the day, right? Because remember where they were. They were in the Middle East, right? They, they were, there, wasn't, and there weren't paved roads. It was, it was, they were walking in sandals. And so the custom of the day was if you were hosting a dinner party, if you were hosting a gathering in your home, you would make sure that there would be a servant at the door with a wash basin, with a towel, and as your guests would uh, arrive, arrive, they would remove their sandals and you would wash, the servant would wash their feet before they took their place at the table. Why was that important? We sit at a table today and thank God, I don't know how dirty your feet are. <laughs> Hallelujah. Right? I don't know if you've cut your toenails recently. I, uh, praise the Lord. I don't, I don't need to know that. But their tables were anywhere from 12 to 18 inches off the, off the floor. They didn't sit on tables. They reclined around that table. Which means if I'm reclining here and this guy's reclining here, my feet were dangerously close to his face. So they wanted to make sure that those feet were clean. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Evidently, there was no one that night to wash the feet of Jesus and his disciples as they arrived in that home. They all walked into that room, which means this, that every single one of them, every one of those disciples walked right by the wash basin and the towel. Every single one of them knew what the custom was, and yet not one of them said, you know what? Why don't I take it upon myself? to make sure that all my brother's feet are clean, especially, more heartbreaking than all, the fact that Jesus, the master, walked into that same room and not one of them said, let me, let me go wash my master's feet. They didn't even think about serving Jesus. So Jesus arises from the table and preaches one more sermon without words. He quietly walks to the water basin and begins to remove his outer garment. By the way, that outer garment was representative of his authority as rabbi. This is a beautiful picture of what we're going to read in this a little while in Philippians chapter 2 when, when Paul speaks about God the Son coming and becoming man. And he strips himself of the divine prerogatives and he takes the humble, the humble position of a servant. This is a great picture of that. He takes off his robes of authority and then he puts on the towel of a servant and he pours water into the basin and he begins to kneel in front of every single one of those followers to wash their dirty feet, just like the lowest and the, and the smallest of servants would have done. And after returning to the table, Jesus says something that's very important for you and I to, to, to grab a hold of today. In John 13, 15, he says this, I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Now, that doesn't mean that you need to wash everybody's feet all the time. Can I hear a praise the Lord for that? <laughs> right? That's not what he's saying. He said, I have just served you. I've given you an example of what, what I do and what my followers do. I have just served you and I have given you, I have left you an example. The last picture you have of me before I go to the cross for you is of me washing your stinky, dirty feet. In other words, he says this, I, wanna, I want you to be like me. You need to be like me. If I'm going to get my mission accomplished on this earth, you need to be like me. If I'm going to get the glory and the honor that I deserve and my father deserves, you need to be like me. And I want to just quickly make some, some very simple observations regarding this incredible, you know, I've said this before, but you know, people say that the Sermon on the Mount was Jesus' greatest sermon, but in my estimation, I think this was his greatest sermon he ever preached and without even using any words. Because he left an indemnable in, uh, image in the mind of his disciples of what it means to follow him. And I, and I hope it does for you too. But here's the first observation I want to make. Like Jesus, I need to arise 
and serve. Will you say that with me? Like Jesus, I need to arise and serve. Come on, say it like you mean it. Like Jesus, I need to arise and serve. Verse 4 says, so he arose from the table. Where did he arise from? The table, took off his outer garment, and tied a towel around his waist. Now, we've talked about the fact that to arise means to change positions, right? To arise means to, to come onto the scene. And so there's this vacancy in that room. The vacancy was of a servant to meet a need. And Jesus came onto the scene and took that and filled that vacancy, filled that void. He changed positions from reclining at the table to arising to serve. He was reclining at the table, eating his pita and, and hummus, probably giving some time to his disciples for his disciples to maybe get the, get the idea that, gee, I'm sick and tired of, of seeing this guy's feet. Maybe I should get up and clean them. But you know what? Mine are just as dirty, so hey. The need was there. Every one of those disciples was capable of serving. There was nothing in them. There was no physical limitation in them. But instead, they stayed in their comfort zone, feeding their faces. Listen, eating is essential. Some of you are fasting right now, and you're like, yes, it is, Pastor. It is. It's essential. Both the physical and spiritual realm, in the physical and spiritual realm, eating is essential. There is a time to make sure that we pull up to the table and receive the spiritual nutrients we need. Every Sunday you pull up to the table and I hopefully the pastors present to you some food that will nourish you spiritually, that will encourage you sp spiritually, that will teach you and rebuke you, whatever it is the word has to do, so that when you get up from the table... But like Jesus, there has to be a time to eat, right? I want to be like Jesus. And undoubtedly, I've got to feed on God's word or I'm going to starve spiritually. But if I want to be like Jesus, there's a time to sit and eat, but there's also a time to arise and serve. Feed me more, pastor. Feed me more. Ooh, that's good, that's good, that's good. How I many know that if we eat, 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 and there's no exercise, it's not good for you? There are a lot of spiritually fat Christians in churches all around this country. Their arter spiritual arteries are getting clogged up. They're losing spiritual muscle because they don't want to use anything that God has given them. But it's time, church, to stop being that way. It's time to do what? Come on, church. What is it time to do? It's time to arise and serve. See, Jesus doesn't just want us to do as he does. Listen to me very carefully. He wants us to be as he is. Jesus didn't just serve. He took the form. He had the heart of a servant. And he wants us to have his heart. He wants us to have his heart. He wants our service to come from within us with the right motivations. You know, every, every year we, in our I Serve uh, banquet, we, we honor all of our, our serve team members and, and the way they serve throughout the year and during Christmas time, we, we just, we, we, we feed them <laughs> because they've been serving. And, and we just, and we honor them and we give them a little gift and we, we choose servant leaders of the year and every one of those that we have chosen throughout the years, I have said this about him. It's not just what they do, it's who they are. They don't just show up, clock in, so to speak, for a couple hours on a Sunday. But when they leave, they're still serving. No matter where they are, they're serving. It's not a matter of the doing. It's also a matter of the why we do it, right? See, his disciples didn't serve because they had the wrong motivation. What was their motivation? Selfishness. 
Selfishness. So Jesus emphasized the why as much or even more sometimes than the what. Why do we do what we do? Why? So when it comes to today's subject, the question is, why should I arise and serve? Why should I arise? Well, we've already said that to be like Jesus is to what? Is to serve. And to serve is to be like Jesus. Now that ought to be motivation enough for every single one of us who say we follow Jesus to arise and serve. That alone should be motivation enough. But Jesus lays out some very important motivations for us here in this unspoken sermon. Here's the first and most important, which ties into being like, wanting to be like Jesus. I serve because I love. Can you, can you say that with me? I serve because I love. I love. Notice what he says in verse number one. It says this about him. And John made sure that we understood this. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. Right? He serves them and then he gives his life as a ransom for them. The primary motivation for everything that we do as followers of Jesus is L-O-V-E. For those of you that haven't had your coffee, love. That's our primary motivation. And listen, it's not love for ourselves. The primary motivation is love for God and love for others. At least that's not always an easy thing to do. Can I, can I get an amen? amen? I mean, you think about Jesus right here, right? These disciples at this moment were not an easy bunch to, li- to love. Okay? I mean, I mean, think about this. Here is Jesus. He's about to lay down his life in the greatest act of love ever, ever seen or experienced in all of, the, of human history. And what were the disciples doing? Luke 22 tells us. They began to argue among themselves about who would be the greatest among them. See my stinky feet? I'm greater than you are. How, how, how mind-boggling. The greatest? Really? Really? One of those disciples would deny him. One of them would betray them, him. And ten of them, all ten of them would desert him. And here they are arguing about who would be the greatest. And yet Jesus still served them. He, he served them. He washed Judas' feet. Because he taught us to love our enemies. And he showed us. Why did he still serve them? Because he loved them. He loved them. And he, and he wanted them to make sure that their same, same motivation, that that same motivation was there as to why they serve. Right? Right? He showed them the what of serving. He he actually exemplified it. He showed them. And then he made sure to lay out the why of serving in verses 34 and 35. The Bible tells us after Judas had left the room to go do the dirty deed of betraying Jesus, Christ turned to his disciples and reminded them of the why. Look what he says. A new what? Command I give you. Now stop for a second. What is it? You can't command emotions. You cannot command feelings. So he's giving them a new command, which means it's an act of our will. It is a choice that we make. And the command is this. What is it? Love one another. Come on, turn to somebody and say, that's you. That's you. I got to love you. And then he says, well, maybe they thought, well, what kind of love are you talking about, Jesus? I mean, what kind of love? Well, as I have loved you in the same manner that I have loved you, so you must love one another. How did Jesus love us? Sacrificially. Serving them. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you're a member, an official member of a church. 
if you speak in tongues, if you can quote the scriptures left and right, no, if you love one another. That's how people are going to know you follow me. Later that night, he says this, if you love me, you will obey what I command. What did he command? Love one another. And one of those apostles never forgot that lesson. One of those apostles embraced it, exemplified it, lived it out. His name was John. In his old age, he writes this in 1 John 3, 16, his first letter. He says, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. Everybody say, praise the Lord. But he goes on. Did Jesus Christ lay down his life for you? Well, then we ought to lay down our lives for our brother. You love as I have loved you, Jesus said. Well, Jesus loved us so much he laid down his life. That means that we need to love like him in the same manner, which means that we need to lay down our lives. Everybody say sacrificial love. What does it mean to have sacrificial love? That means you're going to have to sacrifice something. It means it's not always going to be easy. It means there's going to be time and effort and sometimes money and and headaches and heartaches and all the stuff that comes along with it. But guess what? If we're going to be like Jesus, we got to love like him. He goes on in in chapter four. He says, this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and has sent his son as an atoning what? Sacrifice for our sins. Look what he says. Dear friends, Since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. How many love Jesus? Come on, how many love Jesus? Then that love ought to motivate you to arise and serve. That love that you said you just testified to ought to motivate you to do what? To do what? Here's the second motivation observation onto why to arise and serve that I see from this, from this, and this I serve because I value others above myself. And that's tied into love. You know, everything flows from love, right? We want to be like Jesus because we love him. We, we love others because we love Jesus and he loved us first. And, 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 and so I have to value others above myself because that's what love is. I'm sure I don't have to convince you. I don't have to spend a lot of time convincing you that people as, as a whole, by nature, we, we have one person that we really love to take care of. Who is that? Ourselves. Right? That's right. Numero uno. Right? It's all about make. listen, we make sure, listen, from the time we're born, ask the nursery workers who those babies think about. They don't care how bad of a day they had. They're going to make them know, I have a need, feed feed me, change me. And it doesn't change much. We have 40-year-olds that are doing still the same stuff. Because by nature, nobody has to convince us to take care of ourselves. It was true in Jesus' day and it's true today. Because that's human nature. That's the fallen nature of man, right? But Jesus was different. You think about this. This is his last supper. Jesus knew what was awaiting him. He knew the gruesome death that he was about to experience just a few short hours later. He knew the hell that he was going to, literally the hell he was taking upon himself. The wrath of God. He knew that was waiting for him. Listen, no one would have blamed him for being concerned about his own needs that night. But instead he focused on the needs of his disciples. So I don't want too much more time with these guys. They got to get this. If they don't get this, my mission's not going to be accomplished. I need them to get this. And Jesus showed us that night that he valued his disciples above himself. And again, he didn't have to demean himself to do that. That's not either, oh, I got to demean myself. If I, no, no, no. You can value others and still understand who you are in Jesus Christ. He knew, again, he was secure in himself. And Paul writes beautifully about this mindset of Jesus that he wants us to have in his letter to the Philippians. In Philippians chapter 2, he says this, Therefore, if you have any encouragement 
from being united with Christ, any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, the apostle says, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one and of one mind. And he shows us what this one mind is, one spirit. Do nothing out of what? What kind of ambition? Selfish ambition or vain conceit. That's hard to do. That's, that's, that's a mindset you and I have to develop because it will come naturally to do things out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Therefore, we need the Holy Spirit to help us to keep in mind not to do anything. He says nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, do what? Value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. So he shows us the key characteristic, which Jesus again exemplified in order for us to value others, it's humility. It takes humility to value others above myself. If, if the opposite of humility is pride, and pride is, is, is fueled by selfishness, by an inward focus. Therefore, if I am going to value others, I cannot be selfish. I cannot be inward focused. If I'm going to be valuing others above myself, there takes this, this, this determination to humble myself, right? To develop that humility of, uh, that Jesus is characterized by and to humbly value others above myself. And Paul goes on to remind us of the greatest example of humility, humility the universe has ever seen in verse number five. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Come on, turn to somebody and say, the same as Jesus. I want to be like Jesus. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, what did he do? He humbled himself in obedience to God and died your death, my death. He died a criminal's death on a cross. When we value ourselves above others, it's selfish pride. When we value others above ourselves, it's Christ-like humility. And Jesus, Jesus died this criminal's death so he could kill my pride and unleash his humility to serve, even unto death. So if you're prepared to value others above yourselves, then you better get ready to arise and serve. You better get ready to... Do you love Jesus? Then you need to... Are you ready to value others above yourselves? Then you need to... Let me close with one last motivation observation to arise and serve. I serve because I want to be great and blessed. You say that with me? I serve because I want to be great. Gee, pastor, that sounds like a pretty selfish motivation to me. Didn't you just say that to think about yourself? Didn't you just finish telling us that true servants value others about, be above themselves? Yes. Yes, it does sounded like a little bit of a selfish motivation. But the only reason it sounds like a selfish motivation is because we define greatness the way the world defines greatness. But Jesus, he redefined greatness for us. The kind of greatness Jesus 
wants us to experience, the kind of greatness Jesus wants to give us does not come from being rich, famous, and powerful. It doesn't come from having everything I want and having all the great goodness. No, it comes, and it is a greatness that this world cannot understand. You can talk to an unbeliever till you're blue in the face. They will never understand the kind of greatness that Jesus redefined and exemplified for us. It's true greatness. Verse 12 of John 13. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor his, is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, come on, say that last part, you will be blessed if you do them. Can you personalize that? Say, I will be blessed if I do them. She said, you know, Jesus sometimes talked, uh, he spoke and you kind of like, uh, okay, Lord, what, what were you really saying here? It almost, something he spoke and it was almost like in riddles, right? And you're like, is this, what? what? And, it, and it's kind of like this here, but the reason he does that, let me share why he does that. That's the re same reason he, he taught in parables is because he only wants those that really want to know to know. Those that really don't care about knowing the truth of God, they're going to hear it and move on. But those that want to grow and become more like Jesus are going to say, okay, whoa, 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 stop. And let me think about this. What exactly is he saying here? And they will take the time and make the effort to discover the truth that God has placed before us. He wants to know that the desire is there. Does that make sense? So this is what he's saying here. He's basically saying this. Listen, Jesus is basically asking his disciples, do you think I'm great? And his disciples are like, yeah. You are the greatest teacher that's ever existed. You are the rabbi of all rabbis. You are Lord. You're the great I am. You are our Lord. Of course, Jesus, you're the greatest. And then Jesus is basically saying this. Well then, if I, being the very epitome of greatness, just served you, in what the world considers the most demeaning of all services, washing dirty, stinking feet. For you to do any less is to diminish your greatness. You want to be great? Great is this way, not that way. You guys are arguing about greatness. You're arguing about the greatness the world has to offer. That greatness doesn't last. That greatness never satisfies. The greatness I have to offer you will keep you full of joy and peace and purpose and keep you fulfilled until you see me face to face. The greatness I have to offer you is the one that I have just revealed to you. So what Jesus does in this moment is that he flips the definition of greatness upside down from the world's definition of greatness. You want to be great? Stoop to the lowest position. You want to be great and blessed? Serve. Don't find out what's the best place for you to serve. Find out what's the place that nobody wants to serve and serve. Well, I want to serve where I'm seen. That's the world's definition of greatness. And you'll never have joy. I want to serve where I think it's convenient for me. 
Jesus, I know you want me to serve, but I choose when and where and how much. Fine. Then you're just uh, settling for a fraction of the greatest, the greatness and the blessing that God wants to give you. In Mark 10, he says, if you want to be the greatest, then live as one called to serve others. I like, the, I like this, that this translation, the passion is live as one called, which means when you go home today, what, what are you there? Servant. When you go to work tomorrow, even though you're getting paid, what are you there? A servant. When you're in Walmart, what are you there? You know, our community center, you've been there? When you're in Amigos or in United, what are you there? When you're driving through McDonald's and the person on the other end of that lousy speaker doesn't get your order right, what are you there? Well, how do I serve in the line to McDonald's? Well, how about if you pay for the person's meal behind you? And tell the person, tell them that Jesus just paid for their meal. See, we look for the things that, oh, this is serving. No, no, listen, every act of service. If you give a a glass of cold water to someone in the name of Jesus, that is servanthood. That is serving the Lord, motivated by love for him, love for others. That is you valuing others above yourself. Here's what Jesus is still teaching the church today. Because let me go on, verse 44. the, The path to promotion comes by having the heart of a bond slave who serves whom? Everyone. It's the heart. It's the heart. It's not what I do, it's who I am, right? For even the Son of Man did not come expecting to be served by by everyone, but to serve everyone and to give his life as the ransom price for the salvation of many. Now, God's not calling you to give your your life as a ransom for many because you don't have the ability to, but he did. And we honor those that have given their lives for the freedom of this country, don't we? Because it's the ultimate sacrifice. There's no greater love than to lay down your life for someone else. And we may never be called to do that. But I'll tell you what we've been called to do. We've been called not maybe not to die for everybody, but we've been called to live in service to everyone. To live in, in love for Jesus and others. And this is what Jesus is still teaching his church today. True greatness comes from serving others. Tell the person next to you that true greatness comes from what? What? Tell them, tell them. So let me ask you this question. Do you want to be great and blessed? Do you want to be great and blessed? Wait, wait, don't answer yet. Don't you want to pray about this? No, 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 no. That's the answer I usually get when I ask someone to serve. Well, let me pray about it. If I had a dollar. Well, pastor, let let me just pray about that. Nah. You and I don't have to pray about doing what God has already made very clear we ought to be doing. Let me say that again. You and I don't have to pray about doing what God has already made very clear we ought to be doing. Amen? Amen. I don't have to get up every morning and say, she, I wonder if God wants me to be his witness today. (laughs) Gee, I wonder if God wants me to love my wife and my kids and my grandchildren today. I don't have, for 30 plus years, I haven't had that. Lord, I wonder if God wants me to tithe and bring offerings so that his gospel can go across this globe. And I've never had to ask, God, I wonder if God wants me to serve him. Because God's word is very clear. You don't have to pray about it. You don't have to pray about it, church. 
All you have to do is arise and serve. You don't have to pray about it. All you have to do is what, church? Arise and serve. Come on, stand with me.